This is the perfect way to spend summer days, cruising around the coast of Britain from port to port, and later I'll be sailing along the Cornish coast on Nightingale, built from, of all things, concrete. But first, to a more traditional wooden boat. I'm restoring a 1950s racing shaft, and the next job, after stripping off the old varnish, is to fill and fare the rather lumpy top sides with some filler. Now this is epoxy resin. It's basically, it's a resin and a hardener. A pump of this, a pump of that, mix it together, and you've got a clear resin, which is with basic glue. It's also got some great gap filling properties, so if we add to it some fillers or some thickeners, then we can turn it into any sort of filler that we want. Um, for example, here I've got some colonial silica. Now, if you mix that in with the resin, it stops it sagging and stops it dropping out of the joint. Um, another one we've got is microfibers, which is a bit stronger than colonial silica, but it's not quite as smooth. You don't get such a good finish, but it's much, much stronger. The strongest filler you can put in, really. Um, the third one being this low-density filler, which is this lovely purple stuff, which is quite hard to mix in, but gives you a lovely lightweight filler. So you don't put on too much weight. <coughs> As you can see, it's dusty, so you've got to watch that. Wear a mask. So what we're going to do is mix up some resin, then add the correct filler. That was two. That was three. That was four. That was five. Now we have the hardener. That was one. That was two. That was three. That was four. That was five. I always have to say that, otherwise I forget how many I've done. A bit of old wood as a mixing stick. Very, very important you get the ratios correct and also you give it a really, really good mix. A couple of minutes of mixing. Get a load of that. And I'm going to sort of fold it in, just like Delia. So this is the sort of consistency we're going for, which is sort of a peanut butter consistency. Right up on there. This is the second application of filler. I've sanded the first layer, and you can see I've marked in chalk the low points that need more filling. I'm using a large flat-sided car to apply the epoxy to hopefully bridge the hills and concentrate the filler into the valleys. That's about it, I think. And this particular boat is, is a hard shine construction, so you've got this corner piece here, you've got the, the top sides and then the bottom. Now, on the top sides on these, they're made up of a couple of pieces of timber which are glued together in the middle and actually all glued onto the frames. So we can treat this part of the boat very much differently than we treat this part. Therefore, we've sealed it with epoxy and we've also filled and fed with epoxy because it's a very dry timber and it won't move very much. The bottom, however, is completely different, and this really is a good example of traditional carvel construction. A carvel construction is when you have lots of separate planks, all tapering towards the ends, and they're touching edge to edge. They're then corked with some corking cotton like this stuff here. That's rammed into the seams, and then over the top of that is a, a putty, or in this case we've used rubber, to protect the cotton and to seal the job off. There are some more modern constructions around now, one of which is strip planking. We've got a few bits of strip planking here. Now when you make a carvel boat, every plank is tapered, every plank is different, and that's quite a skilled job. So to change things slightly for, basically initially for an amateur one-off construction, um, they invented strip plank. And every plank you can see has a, a concave and a convex face, and they all fit together like this. So when it's finished, you can either sheathe it with epoxy resin or add another couple of layers of very, very thin veneer, usually mahogany, over the top to give you a nice fair top size. A much older traditional way of building boats out of wood is called a clinker. This is a good example of clinker boat building. I mean, it's not a floating example, but you can see here how the two planks overlap each other. This means you can have thinner, lighter planks, which gives you a nice light structure. Each plank is held together by a couple of nails that go through and they're clenched up to hold them tightly together, give a nice tight seal between the two. You can see the timbers here, which hold all these planks together as well. And if you notice behind each one is a gap. So if you imagine if you got to the end, there'll be a hole. So what there is, on the bottom of each plank, there's called a gerald or a snake. And very gradually the timber's taken away, so it runs together to give you a nice seal around the outside here. You see here, 
and here. And if you didn't have that, the water would get in, and that would defeat the object. In the 60s and the 70s, fiberglass became very popular. Very popular for mass production, but not so popular for the one-off where you need to build a plug and then a mould before you make your hull. Also around the same time, around the 60s and the 70s, ferro-cement became very, very popular. And this is a ferro-cement boat built by Bob Stewart in the 1970s. Can you tell me a bit about the, the history of how ferro-cement boats came along? The first one I have any knowledge of is way back in the 1870s. And when I built this, the example quoted was still in existence in Brussels on a pleasure lake. Later on in the 30s, it was picked up by uh, an architect by the name of Nervy, who developed the technique for thin shell structures, uh, stadiums and warehouses and things like that. Oh, yeah. And he took it further and designed himself a yacht. Not quite as big as that, but very, very nearly. Um, then the war came along, and then afterwards it was picked up by the Canadian designers and by New Zealanders who specialised in it. Right. And this is a Canadian design, this one. And uh, it was 12 months to the day from me first setting it up in a, in a gantry right. to actually plastering it. So that's a steel, a steel framework welded together? It's a steel framework with yeah. horizontal steel rods every three inches. Right. And right. one eighth steel rods vertically every inch and a half. Right. And then there are seven layers of mesh, three inside and four outside, all tied together with little, no, little like hairpins. Right and twisted laboriously with a pair of pliers. You must have quite I employed that. the local <laughs> scouts actually to come and do this. Did you really? At one time, yes, yeah. when, thing, when the programme was getting a bit tight. Yeah. Um, but mainly it was built by my son and myself. He was only in his early teens then. So how far have you been in there? Oh my God. It's about 28,000 miles. 28,000 miles? Yeah, we've been across yeah. the Atlantic a number of times. Yeah. We've been down to the, down to the Gambia. Yeah. In fact, we've been up the Gambia. A bit like the Heart of Darkness by Conrad, a wonderful experience. This gorgeous boat is Nightingale. Now, although she looks wooden, she's actually made of ferro cement. It's double-ended, very full, very roomy, very strong, powerful boat. All those combinations make for a great, seaworthy cruising boat. And today, we're going to go out with her owners, Ron and Beth, for a bit of coastal cruising. I've joined them in Falmouth, Cornwall, as they make their way along the south coast, sailing during the day and spending their evenings in port. Ron and Beth Hansen are experienced sailors who enjoy racing. However, it was their quest for something more comfortable that led them to Nightingale. So were you actually looking for a ferro cement boat? No, we weren't. We realised that if we bought a, a wooden boat, we weren't sure whether we had the skills, um, uh, or the income for that matter, to be able to look after a bigger boat, um, which was a traditional wooden boat. So when we saw the opportunity of Nightingale, um, and she was a ferro cement boat, we weren't at all sure and felt a bit insecure about it at the first place. But once we saw her and got to know her and understand her, um, we realised that she was exactly what we were looking for. And we have all the advantages of a traditional boat with the low maintenance and the extremely well uh, constructed ferro cement idea, which was very popular in the 80s and has proved to be a very, very warm, dry and pleasant environment to, to sail in. Morning. We're up here in the forecastle of Nightingale. It's a sumptuous bedroom. It's across between somewhere to sleep in Aladdin's cave. There's all sorts of lovely varnished navigation lights and blocks and an absolute heavenly place to go to sleep, if you ask me. Going through here, we've got a heads. And on our left-hand side, a nice big wood-burning stove to warm up your socks in the middle of winter. This is the nicest little setup for wood burner I've seen. Right down to the stovepipe thermometer up here for telling you how hot your chimney is. Down here, a little bucket of kindling for lighting the fire. Isn't that lovely? Here's a galley. Looks like it's my turn to be washing up again. And then through here, the gimbal cooker. So you can still make tea when you're healing over. Now Ron's put the bowsprit down, it's hinged just underneath me, and one of the great things about a hinging bowsprit is it's very easy to take up and put back down again. This means when you go to a marina, where they charge you for your overnight stay with length, you can shorten the bowsprit and save yourself a few quid. And when it's down, it doesn't break off because it's supported by four wires. A bob stay that runs down below, two whiskers that come out each side, and the four stay that goes up to the top of the mast. 
it's our trolley at the top, that wire carries right back down to one side here where it's tensioned to the lock and tackle, so it's really tight. Before we put the sails up, we steered the boat right into the wind. This makes raising the sails a lot easier as they're not driving the boat. Excellent, now we're sailing. I'm turning the engine off, have a cup of tea. Even though we're not going out to sea today, just cruising around the coastline, safety can be an issue if the weather were to suddenly change. Now when you're going to sea, it's important to follow some golden rules. You really must check the weather, you must check what the tides are doing, and you must carry some decent safety equipment. So everyone on this boat has got a life jacket, including a dog. And last, it's very important to tell somebody where you're going, and most importantly, tell them what time you're going to get back. The English coastline is littered with rocks just below the water, so hugging the coastline, like we're doing, can be dangerous. Today, we have detailed charts and navigation aids to make sure we avoid them. But in the early days of sailing, the sea was an alien environment, especially at night. To guide the sailors away from rocks and into ports, lighthouses were built, like this one at Stark Point in Devon. OK, let's have a look inside. Even so, risk of death was high. Sailors' woolen jumpers were knitted with patterns such as cables and other shapes, indicating which port they were from, should they be found dead in the sea. They even wore gold earrings to be sold to pay for a funeral. But despite all the modern technology, the English coastline has retained most of its lighthouses as a visual aid for modern sailors. Pleased to meet you, Rob. Thank, Thank you very much. This is great, isn't it? What's, what's going on here? Well, we have a new lighthouse keeper, and there it is. I thought you were the lighthouse keeper. I'm the old lighthouse keeper. This is the new one. OK. How does that work? It's an electronic box of tricks that is monitoring what the lighthouse does. Now, this lighthouse is working all by itself. This is telling Harwich on the Essex coast, where our, all our computers are, what is going on. And it will also report any faults. As you can see, we have a little red light showing here. It's indicating we have a failure on one of the emergency bulbs. Yeah. Engineers from Penzance will be coming to fix that shortly, and that's what I'm waiting for. So, what are all these batteries here then? Do they run the light? They used to. When we had a power failure here, they were the original and only backup source. Been superseded now by a generator in the basement, right. but they still turn the lens upstairs. Right. Which is, of course, the main light. Right, so this lamp here isn't the main lamp. No, no, this is a subsidiary light that shines a red light out through the window. We have a bank of shingle out there. It is very dangerous and shipping has to be warned of it. Right, OK. Can we have a look at the, the big one? Let's go. I'll follow you up. Be careful on the stairs. Thank you. In Britain, the first onshore lights were run by the church and later by the Guild of Seamen. It was Henry VIII who granted a royal charter to the Trinity House Guild in Deptford to build and manage our lighthouses, as they have done ever since. We <laughs> So this is the main light? This is the main lantern of Star Point, yes. Right. And how does it produce its, its flashes, which are identified on a chart? Well, very complicated, but simple if you know how. To make the Star Point work properly, we're going to produce six beams of light. Right. Each one starts light from one of the six bullseyes we've got. Three have just gone past, and here come three more. There, there, and one more. Right. Now, it doesn't matter at all that four out of the six bullseyes are half size. That makes no difference to the effect of the beam or the brightness of it. The middle bit of each bullseye is a very powerful magnifying glass, surrounded by rings of refractive prisms. And the combination of that magnifying glass and those prisms produces a parallel beam of light. We've got six bullseyes, we have produced six beams. Now we're going to make it flash. Right. As you can see, what we don't do is turn the bulb on and off. That wouldn't work at all. The bulb would last about five minutes if we did that to it. So how do we make a lighthouse look like it's flashing? Well, in truth, we don't do anything. It's already been done. When you're a ship out there, you only see the full intensity of each one of these beams for a split second. As the beam swings around, it points at you very briefly, then it's gone. And then it looks like a flash. Right. We've got three beams close together. You get three flashes close together. This whole lens goes around once every 20 seconds, mm -hmm. so start point produces three white flashes every 10 seconds. Right. And that's how we do it. 
So was the lighthouse always lit by electricity? Not at all, no. In its early days, it was an incandescent oil burner, okay. which is basically you and I know as a tin lamp. Right, yes. If you put paraffin under pressure, it vaporises. We light the jet, play the flame onto the silk mantle, which eventually glows white hot. Nothing like a thousand watt bulb. Right. But that's all we had, and we had to make that go through 20 miles. Mm. And of course, pre-electric, the whole thing was driven by clockwork. Really? But the oil keeper has to stay up here all night long and wind it up. Really? So how long, how long was the well there? It took about an hour and 20 minutes to get from the top right to the bottom. And of course, when that happened, the whole thing stopped. So the idea of a, of a lighthouse keeper sitting down there with his feet up, drinking tea and reading the paper, it was really nonsense. I mean, he spends all his time <laughs> running up the stairs, winding the handle. Well, well that's right. right. I mean, you're exactly right. You imagine at night time, the poor old keeper here all by himself, he's winding this thing up, keeping the weight above this floor. Mm -hmm. Then he has to go down to the basement to get bags of coal to chuck on the kitchen range. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'd better go down and get a few cans of oil to keep this thing going all night. And, oh, I'd better wind it up and get yeah, it. Oh, a, he was a busy chap. He's very fit chap. Yes. Yeah. Our aim on Nightingale is to steer well clear of the rocks, all of which are on the charts, so there's no excuse. This is a navigational chart. Most of the information here is to do with the sea. There are some features on the land. There's our old friend the lighthouse here. But most of the information here is to do with depths, the white area is the deepest, the light blue becomes a little shallower, and the dark blue is shallower still. Once you get right up into the green here, it's really shallow, and that area actually dries. What we're doing today is we're sailing out of Falmouth Harbour. We're going to sail off this way, and we're going to take some fixes from the land with a hand-bearing compass, and plot our position accurately, so at all times we know exactly where we are. Now this chart here, the land is all plotted with true north. These vertical grids here are all true north. Now, magnetic north is variable. It's variable all over the world. In this particular area, it's actually 4 degrees, 25 minutes to the west, different to true north. So it's important to bear in mind what's magnetic north and what's true north when you're taking a fix and plotting your position. Now, before we can figure out a course to steer, we first got to put our position. We're going to use a hand-bearing compass so we can see exactly the bearing off either the headland or the church or whatever plot it back on the chart. So I'm just picking up the end of that headland there, you can see the closer headland where it disappears into the sea. So it'll be quite easy to find on the chart. That's 270. I'm writing them down as I go because I've got a brain like a sieve. Next one we'll do over here. That headland over there is 063 degrees. And the last one is that church spire over there. Very handy they built a church there. Must have known we were coming 400 years ago. About 330. So back down at the chart table, we get our course plotter. The first bearing we've got is 270 less to deviation, which is 266. 266. Next one is 066 degrees, minus 4 degrees for variation, so that's 062, which is there. So that's Dublin Point, that'll be down there. And the last one is the church, which is 330, less 4 degrees, which is 326. Okay, there's the spire. There we are. So there is our position, and that was at 14.55. So the hammering compass, at 5 to 3, has given us three fixes. One, two, three, and that is our position. So now we know our position, Ron can set the course to take us safely round the headland. Now this particular boat, although she looks old-fashioned on the outside, is actually bristling with modern electronics. Here, the heart of the system is the GPS. Signals are received from satellites orbiting the Earth, and they plot our position accurately on this electronic chart. Here you can see this dotted line shows how we came out of Falmouth. The loop here is where we put the sails up. And this is where we're sailing along the track now. This triangle shows the boat here. This is linked to a plotter. This is a quick and easy way of plotting that position onto a paper chart. Underneath this chart here is this blue base. And in there is a magnetic electronic grid, which means that whenever you get this plotter and put it onto the chart, see these arrows here? You move it around till they all zero. 
like oh, like that. And we can get a pencil, make a little dot, and I haven't even had to leave the navigation table. Now the main GPS system down below also has a repeater up on deck here. At the moment it's showing our speed over the ground, see, in knots. We're doing 4.5 knots over the ground. Now that's not speed through the water. Speed through the water would be affected by the tide against us, would go slower. The tide with us would go faster. It's simply how fast we're moving over the Earth's surface. It's got some other gizmos as well. Our course over the ground, 245 degrees, magnetic. Again, it could be biased by the tidal flow, maybe sideways, one way or the other. So that's not necessarily our heading. Finally, we go on to auto. And this also is linked up to the automatic pilot. And on the top of the rudder, there's a very small ram. And that small ram controls an even smaller rudder behind the main rudder itself. So you can see here, we've fixed the tiller. The ram is moving in and out and making very small adjustments to keep us heading precisely on the right course. But to be honest, coastal cruising isn't just about navigation and charts. It's about exploring the coast, taking it easy and finding a good pub and restaurant in the next port this evening. Back in the workshop, the filler has set, so it's time to fare the hull using a longboard. The whole idea behind a longboard is to give you a fair flat surface, because if you look at the base of your average sander, which is only about so long, um, that really is going to give you a very smooth finish, but it won't give you a fair finish. There could be some gentle undulations in it. So the idea behind the longboard is to bridge the high spots, and that should give you a really nice fair finish. Now you can see, what we're trying to achieve is scratching marks in both directions all over. You can see that we've got some low spots here and along this bottom edge here. So we'll get the whole of the hull flat boarded off like this before we can do another film later on. So there is still plenty of work to be done before we achieve that car bodywork finish we're looking for. Then we can finally get some paint on the hull.